welcome dear students to epg pathshala i am dr k s nagaraja of deccan college pune teaching the course of historical linguistics in this particular module we study the historical linguistics from an indian perspective whatever has been studied so far is more to do with the western perspective though with lots of indian examples thrown in however if you look at the sanskritic texts particularly uh, it, it not only sanskrit but also prakrit we see there was a tradition and various scholars did discuss the linguistic change which had happened in the languages modern linguistics was introduced to indian scholars only in recent times actually uh, around 1940s and 1950s it was mostly due to the efforts of professor s m katre the director of Saint of deccan college pune in maharashtra who negotiated with rockefeller foundation and succeeded in getting funds for conducting summer schools in linguistics however it may be pointed out that the science of linguistics was not unknown to ancient indians the study of grammar may have been in vogue even before the pada texts they were developed as a means of preserving the vedic texts and their study is designed to teach the beginning and the end of words the analysis of a word into a stem and a suffix of a verbal stem into its root and a prefix of a compound into a prior and posterior comp component were known to the users of the vedic language vyakarana was included under shadanga the six ancillary texts for the correct understanding of the vedas and it was considered as the most important of them they practiced it in the name of uh, language analysis and they had certainly excelled in this as they had in many other fields of study grammatical studies in india date back to several centuries before christ it is well known that panini gave to the world a synchronic grammar of sanskrit in his ashtadhyayi in 5th century bc what we find in his grammar is the finest point that was reached in linguistic analysis and there had been several grammarians before him as he himself mentions in his grammar 10 names have been mentioned most of them are only names and no work of theirs has come down to us as it happens in any field when a better work comes out all other in inferior ones will will be forgotten and get lost according to ramakrishna gopal bhandarka panini sastradhyay has remained to this day a wonder of accuracy comprehensiveness and insight into the nature of language coupled with an unparalleled rigor in methodology also leonard bloomfield a pioneer in american linguistics has said about panini's grammar that it is one of the greatest monuments of human intelligence he has kept a copy of ashtadhyayi by the bedside and was in the habit of reading a few sutras before he went to sleep panini's work continues to inspire linguists of the present day and numerous attempts are being made to read in his methodology the principles of such diverse forms of grammar as descriptive analysis historical growth and transformation of generative approach to language ancient indian grammatical grammar grammarians described a language based on its usage by the speakers prayoga sharana vyakarana 
Thus, it may be said that Indian grammars were descriptive in nature and not prescriptive. Many and important technical terms of Pananya's grammar are already found in the early works. In Gopata Brahmana, we find a few of these terms mentioned ko dhatuhu, kim pratipadikam, kim lingam, kim vachanam, ka vibhakti, ka pratyaha, etc. That means what is the root, what is the stem, what is gender, what is number, what is case, what is suffix, what is accent, prefix, particle, what indeed is analysis, what is modification, what is modified, how many moras, how many sounds, how many syllables, how many words, etc. Panini presents his grammar in sutra style. A sutra is a formula like statement with as few words as possible. Not a single syllable was unnecessarily used and the grammarians rejoiced in saving even half a mora in formulating their sutras as they would at the birth of a son. Brevity was their guiding principle and thereby sometimes it was difficult to understand their intention. Therefore, Vartikas Bhashyas became necessary for correct interpretation. The sutras are arranged in, in the order of their application and several principles were used based on this ordering to get the correct output. The concept of bleeding rules and feeding rules in deriving forms were known to them. The transparency which was noticed in Panini's grammar in analyzing words into stems and suffixes helped in the development of comparative study of languages. The Karaka section in Asadhyayi gave the impetus for the birth of case grammar in Western linguistics. Ponini postulates two layers in analyzing a sentence, one of meaning which he calls and the underlying or deep structure represented by Karaka or semantic relations and another of expression or surface structure represented by vibhakti or morphemic endings. He postulated six karaka relations for Sanskrit, apadana, sampradana, karana, adhara, karma, and kartra, and also stated the relative strength of these karakas. One can find an inkling of the concept of phoneme in the work of Bhartrahari, another grammarian of 450 to 510 AD. He states in his Vakyapadiya that although the difference between words kupa, yupa, supa is stateable in terms of a sound, we cannot assign any meaning to it since the ka sound in kupa is also found in the word kalasha, but there is no meaning common to these two words. It was understood that Ka sound in Kupa is the same as the Ka sound in Kalasha and also that a single sound brings about distinction in the meaning of words. Thus, the sound Ka in Kupa may be said to distinguish it from the words Yupa and Supa. Also, the word Kupa loses its meaning if it is uttered without the initial consonant. Further, we find in the early Indian linguistic discussion a full awareness of the view that the basic linguistic unit upon which all other analysis must be founded is the sentence. In Vakyapadiya, we have a statement to this effect which goes thus. Within the sound units, the component futures have no independent existence, nor the sound units within a word, nor have the words any separate existence apart from the sentence. Just as Sanskrit was described by Panini, in later years the Prakrit languages were described by Vararuchi and Hemachandra in 12th century AD and others following them thus laying down the basis for a historical study of a group of related languages, a tradition which unfortunately was lost in more recent days. It is not claimed here that these grammars were complete specimens of historical type. Historical linguistics 
may be said to deal mainly with two things with treatment of changes and methods of prehistory. Accordingly, Hemachandra in the 8th chapter of his Siddha Hemachandra, Shabdhanusasana and Vararuchi in his Prakrita Prakasha dealt with changes that the Prakrits had suffered in all its details. As for the other topic, they implicitly believe that Sanskrit language which was available to them from earlier times was really the previous stage of the language of which the Prakrit languages formed the latest stage and had developed from Sanskrit. They therefore did not think it necessary on their part to reconstruct an earlier stage for Prakrit languages employing methods of prehistory. And thus they did not develop such methods of reconstruction. Hemachandra considers only Tadbhava forms that is derived and derivable forms of Sanskrit and has not included Tatsama or Sanskritic or Desha native words. Prakrit grammars were produced on the model of Sanskrit grammars. The techniques employed by Ponani in his grammar are carefully followed here also. Thus we find the use of heading Adhikara Sutra, Adehe, Samyuktasya and Dittoing, Anuvritti, General Rules, To, Daha and their exceptions, Spatike, La and formation of list of items which undergo the same operation. In discussing the various concepts of historical grammar, we really hear mostly on Hemachandra's grammar and the rules cited are all from the 8th chapter of his grammar. Although grammatical study is very old in India, the advent of historical study is however from at, at late, as late as 12th century. Since there was until then no further state of Sanskrit language was available to them. Accordingly, Sanskrit shak, shaktam be able and khadgaha swar result in sato and khago respectively. And by the rule anadu shesha deshayor dvitvam, the remaining consonant not being initial gets double. The correct final forms sattu and khaggo are obtained. Sometimes two rules may be found simultaneously applicable in a given situation. We must then have a principle to decide unambiguously as to which of the two rules should apply. This is achieved by the Paratva principle which is invoked when there is a conflict between two equally applicable rules. In such instances, the rule that is placed later in the grammar prevails over the rule placed earlier. As in Ponini's grammar, in Prakrit grammar too, the rules are arranged in the order of their application to give the correct final forms of words if more than one rule needs to apply in their derivation. This principle may be illustrated by two rules in the grammar. The rule kaga tada tada pa sa sha sam Urdhvam Luk states that in a cluster Samyuktasya, if the first member happens to be Kagatada, etc., it gets deleted. Hemachandra was aware of the changes that sounds undergo from one stage of development to another. He carefully observed such changes and has neatly classified them. He not only knew the distinction between conditioned and unconditioned sound changes, but also had clear knowledge of the phonetic environment for such changes. Instead of the terms shift and change found in Western linguistics, he uses the colorless term replacement. General rules, that is, changes which affect a whole class of sounds are stated first. The term for change is adesha, replacement, and what can replace a sound is not only overtly expressed sounds and forms, but also zero and environment includes for him also context generally termed in posa. The replacements are treated in an order. 
first those of the vowels and then those of the consonants. Within each class of phonemes, there is again an order. The replacement of short a uh, is followed by the replacement of long a uh, and so on. In the case of consonants again, replacement of ka is given first, then of ga and so on. Sounds which form a natural class and uh, undergo the same replacement are covered in a single rule. Not only phonetic conditioning is recognized, but also lexical conditioning. Though having identical phonetic forms, lexical subsets undergo different changes. Therefore, after stating a change in general terms, the changes governing the subsets are indicated. These subsets may sometimes consist of only a single item. Thus, the final consonant of words classified as feminine is not zeroed out but is replaced by a in Prakrit. Striyam ad avidyutaha. For instance, sarit becomes sariya, stream. Though vidyut lightning too belongs to this subset, it undergoes a different change and is therefore carefully excluded in the above rule. Vidyut becomes vidyu. The A of the initial syllable in samriddhi, prosperity, and such other words is lengthened in sopna, dream, etc. It is replaced by E, sivino, in shaya, and others. It is substituted by A, whereas in word padma, lotus, the substitute is O, pomma. The replacement of a phoneme is given in the order of phonetic positions. First uh, initial and then non-initial, treating the changes of one allophone after another. There seems to be awareness of distinction between a phonological change which disturbs the system as a whole and a phonetic or distributional change which doesn't affect the rest. Within phonological changes, Hemachandra notes merger and split. The rule aita et and auta oat are instances of merger. Sanskrit i and a, which were distinct, have both become a in Prakrit, and similarly, av and o, which were both phonemic, have merged into o. Phonemic split may be noticed in the development of Sanskrit. R. The R in the words Grita, Ghi and others became a member of the phoneme uh, Gaya, while in Kripa, Compassion, etc., it becomes an allophone of La, of E, Kia, and in Ritu, Season, etc., it joins the phoneme U. The phoneme E splits and gets distributed into three different phonemes. Hemachandra has also noticed what is called combinatory chain, that is the replacement of one segment being, re, being dependent on certain replacement of other segments in the word. Thus, in the word Tirtham 4, the vowel E gets the replacement U only when the consonant cluster Rutha is itself replaced by Ha, otherwise the word becomes Titham. Under replacement, not only instances deriving Prakrit forms from Sanskrit forms through regular phonetic class, but also those in which they are not derivable by such laws are included. Thus, Hetham is given as replacement of Adesh, Ad, Adash below, and Us as replacement of uh, Persia, C. Here, the entire Prakrit forum is to be taken as replacement for the Sanskrit forum. A common type of condition, and condition change is assimilation, which is explained in modern linguistics as one sound becoming more like that of its neighboring sound. This process may be considered a simplification of the muscular movements needed to pronounce a given word. Assimilation are classified into two types depending on the linear position, linear direction of the change from the dominant to the changing phoneme. 
In the regressive assimilation, a consonant becomes more like the one that follows it. In other words, the force of the chain proceeds backwards from a phoneme to the one which precedes it. Bhuktam becomes Bhuttam. Progressive assimilation takes place when the first phoneme is dominant and in some way makes the second one more like itself. Yugmam becomes Juggam. It is interesting to note the way assimilation is treated here. Hemachandra's rule states that when a consonant of the group Kagatada etc. happens to be the first member which he calls Urdhvam in a cluster it is replaced by zero. Then another rule states that a, a reminder Shesha as well as a replacement Adesha which are in the non-initial position get double. Accordingly the Sanskrit word Bhuktam first becomes Bhutam and then Bhuttam. On the other hand a consonant of the group Manaya occupying the second position called here Adaha in the cluster will be replaced by zero. Accordingly, the Sanskrit word Yugmam first becomes Yugam and then becomes Yugam. Clearly, the replacement of Urdhvam is an instance of regressive assimilation and that of Adaha an example of progressive assimilation. He clearly indicates what sounds are involved in the two types of assimilation and what position they must be occupying in the cluster. A modern linguist might wonder at the intermediate stage of our author positing a zero before the germination of the reminder or replacement and think it redundant. But for Hemachandra, there is here more phenomena to account for. He takes care of la, fa, wa by one row. They get replaced by zero in either position. Then by another row, he states germination of the reminder or replacement. Ulka becomes ukka, a mutia, etc. That is not all. If the reminder happens to be an aspirated consonant, then the first member of the resulting geminate will be its corresponding unaspirated counterpart. For example, Vaggao, Vyagra, Tigra, Titham, Tirtham, Ford. Thus, the two operations, zeroing of a member and doubling of another, which is a reminder or a replacement, help Hemachandra cover all analogous cases of assimilation very neatly and may be thought of as an instance of combinatory chain where the second operation is dependent on the first. Two special types of assimilation wise palatalization and cerebralization are explained slightly differently. It's interesting to see how he accounts for it. Of the other types of distributional changes, he has observed Swarabhakti, dropping of a whole syllable and metathesis. These changes cannot be stated in general terms but have to be stated by listing instances. Swarabhakti is a process in which clusters are avoided. A vowel is inserted between members of a cluster to separate them. The vowel that is inserted is either A or E. The word Sneha, friendship, for instance becomes Sineha in Prakrit. Swapna, dream, becomes Sivana. And uh, Ratna, jewel, becomes Ratana. Dropping of a syllable is discussed in five sutras. The medial or final syllable ya or ja in the words bhajana, dhanuja, rajakula is zeroed out optionally. The medial syllable ka becomes zero in the words vyakarana and prakara, etc. The term used for metathesis or the interchange of positions by, uh, by sounds in a word is Vetyaya. Of the sounds involved in Vetyaya, one is a liquid. Some examples are Karenu becomes Kaneru, that is elephant. Alana becomes Anala, Feta, etc. The foregoing amply demonstrates 
the clear understanding of the historical method in linguistics as the part of Indian grammarians. Without explicitly stating their theory, they presented the principles underlying it through a lucid explanation of phonological rules. Their theoretical framework was more broad-based than the Western one in which phonetic conditioning alone had been thought of in the early period. The comparison to the terms shift and change, Hemichandra scholarly term replacement may be said to be a better choice. He did not develop a method of reconstruction since for him the earlier state was available in the attested Sanskrit. Both Ponini writing a descriptive grammar of, for Sanskrit and Hemachandra writing a historical grammar for Prakar belong to one and the same Indian grammatical tradition and not surprisingly they follow the same set of general principles of rule formation, rule organization and rule application. The differentiation in details may be attributed to the languages being treated by them. They have both given us good models in their respective areas for either a descriptive or a historical treatment of other Indian languages. To sum up then, the foregoing amply demonstrates the clear understanding of the historical method in linguistics on the part of Indian grammarians. Without explicitly stating their theory they presented the principles underlying it through a lucid explanation of phonological changes. This understanding need to be required for appreciating our own tradition, our own contribution to historical linguistics and also to other fields. Thank you.